founded in 1994 and co-led for 25 years with some radical and very tender comrades, some of whom I think are here today. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm speaking to you from my rent stabilized apartment, um, which if I didn't have it, there would have been no Foundry Theater to run with my tender comrades for 25 years. So I'm speaking to you from this apartment, this blessed apartment on land that was not so blessedly taken from the Lenape people who had a trade route once about three blocks from here. And it was once called Brede Weg. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but Braid Weg is now called Broadway. So in the tradition of the foundry and with the words of Grace Lee Boggs, I wanna welcome everyone to this moment on the clock of the world. As we emerge from lockdown and look up for next, not as a return to normal, because normal's been exposed blessedly, painfully, and globally as not what we meant at all. That normal is not what we mean to rebuild yet again and again with or for each other. And for me, exposing normal has been an incredibly ex inspiring provocation because it has meant that I'm finding increasing numbers of my liberal colleagues in the theater embracing and demanding radical new contexts for their work and for the world in which it is situated. Seeing growing numbers of dedicated artists in political working groups like animating activism or creating new futures or anti-capitalism for artists or single payer healthcare organizing in the Actors' Equity Union, would anyone have ever guessed? This makes me, I could go on and on. Basically, more and more of my liberal colleagues are recognizing that radical change isn't a fearful thing, rather that it's necessary. And that fills me with so much hope. It makes me want to live longer than I'm probably going to be allowed to. So it's the timeliness of these changes, coupled with the radical and fearless vision of theater and film director Milo Rao that provoked me to organize the new Solidarity events. And if you've not yet seen the new Gospel, his unforgettable film, unforgettable film, you still have till midnight to screen it from this same web webpage. And so here we are, this gathering, remarkable theater artists, remarkable artists and organizers of every stripe, co-hosts from across the country and you who've joined us, who I wish more than anything I could see live. I think we're gathered together to share the fullness of this change, which itself is never a landing place. The word tells you there can't be a landing place with change, it's change but perhaps to discover an ecology of future, a living and changing ecology of the future we mean. And at the very least, let's explore what next instead of normal might be. So I also need to announce to you that we've had a sudden change of players in our group for this conversation. Yvonne Senier, who plays Jesus in the New Gospel, couldn't be with us this afternoon because his wife went into labor a couple of hours ago, which I take as an auspicious simultaneity. So one of the disciples from, from Milo's film, an activist named Hervé Fayet, who plays Peter in the New Gospel, is joining us from Senegal to hold the place of Ivan. He jumped in just a couple of hours ago and we welcome him with all our heart. Um, before I pass this over to our illustrious moderator, I want to thank HowlRound very much for all the technical support they've given to the shenanigans of our events. And I also want to thank Frank Heckscher for introducing me to Milo and also for supporting this 
um, for supporting the new solidarity. It means a lot. And so now I'm going to hand the screen over to a beloved comrade and an amazing playwright named Vicky Grise, who's moderating. And I thank you so much for your time, your very precious time and your attention. I can't wait to see you in person again. Okay, let's go. Thank you, Melanie, for your fierce commitment to radical politics, to art making, and to assembly, even in this virtual world, and giving us this opportunity to have this conversation about solidarity with artists in the United States and across the world. My name is Virginia Grice, she, her, hers pronouns. I'm the Mellon Foundation Playwright in Residence at Gadamia Theater in Dallas, Texas a research fellow at Imagination in the Borderlands at Arizona State University, and a member of Atolodad Productions, one of tonight's national co-hosts for this event. I'm calling in from Texas, where I always say the deep south meets the west meets the borderlands. I'm um, in Cedar Park, a little north of Austin, Texas. The Tonkawa, the Apache, the Isleta del Sur de Pueblo, the Lipan Apache tribe, the Texas band of Yaqui Indians, the Kawitekan, the Alabama Cachada tribe of Texas, the Kickaboo tribe, Carizo and Comacrudo, Tigua Pueblo, Cado, Comanche, Kiowa, Wichita, Chickasaw, and Waco peoples are all connected to this land. And before we begin this conversation, I want to acknowledge the land we collectively occupy the following acknowledgement of what to keep in mind as we participate in this digital space is written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb Show. And with Adrian's encouragement has been slightly edited and um, to mark this occasion. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structure and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints, contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging all of this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. I wanna thank the panelists and everyone today who's watching. And before the um, panelists share their stories, a few words from the Foundry. Over this past year, there's been a significant increase in the number of artists and theaters participating in local and national social justice campaign while this is inspiring, it also offers the opportunity to look at the historical challenges of and the future aspirations for relationships between art, its institutions, and social justice movements. What do sustainable relationships look like? How do artistic expression become part of movements in new and provocative ways? How do we engage and share radical imagination? And how do we consider art and artists in the ecology of changing the world? The new gospel holds some of these inquiries as does the visionary work of the artists and organizers assembled for this conversation. If everybody could please join me in this virtual space of Zoom, please, by turning on your cameras. Thank you so much for being here. Again, I'm gonna to continue to express my gratitude. And um, I wanted to give a note to the audience that this evening's conversation will have translation to it. So there may be moments in um, which we pause and listen to other languages. Uh, one of the things that um, Milo did in, it was prepare a manifesto for what he believes the new theater looks like. And one of the statements in the manifesto is that all production should have at least two languages in it. And so this is a panel that will have at least two languages in it. And so I just wanted to make folks aware of that. 
Um, and I actually want to use the manifesto as a structure of sorts for today's conversation. We're gonna have some questions from me and then we're gonna have a moment where everybody can ask questions of each other. And so one of the first points of Nilo's 10 point manifesto is that theater is not just about portraying the world anymore, it's about changing it. And I often say that the very foundation of theater is imagining and building new worlds together. And so by way of introduction, I wanna ask all the panelists, what is the world you're building with your work? How do you see yourself and your work in the ecology of change and social justice? How do you build solidarity between art and movements? So those are a couple of uh, questions that you may wanna tackle in your introduction with yourself and um, of yourself. And I would love to start with Dred Scott and Dred Scott, when you're done, if you don't mind choosing somebody else to speak. Oh, I didn't know I was gonna get to go first or be selected to go first. Um, so I am Dred Scott. I make revolutionary art to propel history forward. I am a professional troublemaker. Um, and I guess the, the, the question of what, what am I doing with my art? How does it build change? I mean, I can't stand the world the way it is. There's a tiny handful of people that controls the great wealth and knowledge that humanity as a whole has created, and it doesn't have to be that way. And I'll pause for a second for translation and continue the thought after that. Um, it's it's translated in the, in the synchronically for oh. every. It's oh. when he speaks, okay. we translate okay. uh, consecutively. Okay. okay, great. So I will then continue. I will okay. try and speak more fluidly. Then, um, and so with a lot of my work, which I'm principally a visual artist, um, and I, you know, my work shows in galleries and museums, but also on street corners with and without permission. But all of it is trying to get an audience to confront a lot of the cohering ideals, largely of American society, but of the world. And a project I did recently called Slave Rebellion Reenactment reenacted the largest rebellion of enslaved people in the history of the United States. There were 350 Black and Indigenous people who marched for uh, two days, covering uh, um, 24 miles, chanting, On to New Orleans, freedom or death, we're going to end slavery, join us. It was reenacting a rebellion that happened in 1811. Um, and the aims and goals of that rebellion were to seize all of Orleans territory, and which is modern day Louisiana and set up a, an African Republic in the new world that would have outlawed slavery. It was the most radical vision of freedom and emancipation in the, the continent of the US at the time. And bringing that into the present where it wasn't just about the past it was actually about the past commingling with the present we brought an army of the enslaved into a major metropolitan u.s city i mean they were prop weapons they were you know prop muskets and machetes and sabers and sickles but it was a really destabilizing vision for those who want America to continue it as, it as it is. And it was a very inspiring and liberating vision for those that were both embodying the freedom and emancipation that was in this, but also people who saw it. And so this was a project that was really trying to sort of re-envision how change has happened historically and, and posit how it might happen in the future. And so Going back to this question of, I can't stand the world the way it is, there's a tiny handful of people that controls the wealth and knowledge that humanity as a whole has created. In brief, we need a revolution. We need to get rid of capitalism. It is a disaster for humanity and is causing tremendous harm. And how that happens and, and what the forces we're up against, those are big questions. And as an artist, I mean, I have some sort of thoughts on that, but I think it's a much broader question than what does the art do? Does it just envision this or does it contribute to people sort of making this new world? And there are plenty of activists that are actually trying to bring forward a movement for revolution, both in this country and elsewhere, um, that I hope that these ideas are helping to deepen people's questioning and of, of how that change could happen and what needs to happen. Because in America, one of the big barriers is people are too damn enamored with thinking like Americans and, and 
trying to, to improve America as opposed to, well, from day one, its conception and foundations are rotten to the core and we need to move beyond that. And so I will pick, uh, I don't know anything about Carlton Turner, so I'd love to hear what Carlton has to say. Um, thank you, Dred. Um, I was just watching parts of, of your reenactment the other night on um, POV, uh, neutral, neutral Ground, um, and um, saw a lot of people that I know. I, my name is Carlton Turner, um, he, him, his pronouns. Uh, I uh, live and work in Utica, Mississippi, which is on the land of the Quapaw the Natchez, the Yazoo, and the Choctaw, Chickasaw people. Um, my family has been in this community for eight generations. Um, as long as there's been a Utica, uh, there's been people from my family here working in an agricultural capacity. Uh, and every generation since that first generation to be here has been part of, of, of tilling and having an intimate relationship with the land. The work that I do here um, is through what we call the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production. Um, and kind of like the tagline is, we're trying to produce the culture that we want to be a part of. Um, much of what Dred said about the ills of capitalism and um, the kind of core of, of this American society uh, is, is at the core of the work that we're trying to, to, trying to reimagine in our community. Um, I live in a community that was built on agricultural production. Um, at one point it had multiple cotton mills, it had lumber and timber yards, it had textile operations, it had many farms and plantations. Um, my family came here from Charleston, South Carolina, from Albany, Georgia, um, you know, many places, um, you know, throughout the, the South came to Mississippi to advance uh, the capitalism through the cotton trading industry, um, living close to the river. That's been a, a hallmark and a gigantic part of, of my understanding about the community that I come from. This community now has no, um, you know, a community that when I grew up and I'm 46 years old, um, produced about 85% of its own food um, because agriculture was at the center of its identity. Um, this community at this point doesn't have a grocery store and has no access to fresh food or, or uh, fresh mm -hmm. produce and has to travel uh, 40, 40 miles round trip to, a, to the nearest grocery store. Um, and so I think about change in the hyper-local stance and how do we change uh, the material conditions of our community? Um, how do we shift the way that our community understands its role in, in food and food production? And how does that food production connect to its cultural identity? Uh, and so we question all of these ideas around economics, around community design, uh, around education, around uh, the history of our region, of our area. Uh, and those are the places in which we're trying to, um, we're trying to reconstruct the social fabric of the community because so much of that has been lost with the, the loss of spaces and places. When you lose a shirt factory that employs a hundred women, you don't just lose an economic engine in the community, you lose an information technology. Um, because there's a communication that happens in that space that doesn't happen anywhere else. Uh, when you lose a high school, you don't just lose that center of education, you're also losing a social space uh, that connected the community across so many different facets. Uh, it, in many, many ways, it was a neutral ground. Um, it was a space where people run into each other and talk to each other about things that are important to the community's development. And when you no longer have those spaces, you see the deterioration of the community um, advance at a rap much more rapid pace. Mm -hmm. So I think our work um, with the Mississippi Center for Cultural Production is about rebuilding that social infrastructure, rebuilding um, the ability to have conversations, to have many of these conversations that, that are not um, present uh, in, the, in the current design of the community. Uh, so I was really struck by the movie. Um, it, was, it was both fascinating, it was both heartbreaking, uh, and also just reaffirming so many of the cultural norms that uh, exist, uh, especially the kind of like European African paradigms that were represented in that, in that uh, mm -hmm. film that exist here in my community. Um, and you know, we talk about the South, 
you have to, you know, talk about that black white paradigm, um, that power shift and that power dynamics. So um, that's, I'm just going to share that. It's really beautiful to be here. Thank you for the invitation, Melanie. Uh, and thank you for the opportunity to have uh, be a part of this conversation. I'm going to pass it over to my, my family, uh, Toshi. <laughs> Hello, um, I'm really happy to be here. I am Toshi Regan. I'm talking to you uh, from Brooklyn, New York. I'm on the land of the Munsi Lenape. And um, I think I missed the, the, the question, but I think it has something to do with how you are um, connecting art or your art to, um, to the, the struggles and um, that, that we all might be facing. And um, I always have a, a hard time with, you know, what do you do with your art? Because I actually don't consider what I do art in a certain way because the tradition of singing um, in my family didn't come from a performative place. And so I come from a singing family on both sides of my family. My father is from Nashville and my mother's from Albany, Georgia. And um, <laughs> yes, I heard you. I was like, oh, we more related than I thought we was. <laughs> and um, and I, I don't remember a time when somebody in my family wasn't singing to me. And, um, and this is how I learned who I was. And this is how I learned who we, who we were and who we are. And this is how I learned where I was. And this is how I learned who to be um, careful of. This is how I learned the conditions of the community that I was in. This is how I learned um, my language. This is how I learned about um, other people around the world who I had not met yet. Uh, it's the whole thing and everything I do comes from that place. And it's, it, um, it is really interesting uh, for me. It's always been hard for me to separate um, that that the, the, the more performative aspects of my career from that place, because the same, the same thing, I, I felt like when people were singing to me, they were never lying to me. And that when I heard the voice of my people, I, it felt like to me, they couldn't lie. Like it was impossible for them to, to sing what they were singing and tell a lie about themselves or their condition at the same time. Um, these are people who, um, you know, Carlton talks about that, that world in the South um, where uh, you grow up and you are really, really uh, separate from the, the aspects of life that you need to be alive. And so that everything you do is about gaining those aspects. And it's just, you know, water, food, <laughs> you know, and then it's like, the, the way that you can educate and the, the different levels of education that you might need in order to, to fight the battles that you now realize that you're alive, you need to fight. And in my family, it's a very um, much based on an oral tradition. So my grandparents who were absolutely brilliant um, didn't have much like school education. Um, my grandfather, you know, managed school up to the sixth grade, my grandmother up to the eighth grade, and they just got, they were just really smart people, and they got going with life, and they just had an incredible visionary understanding of what the possibilities of life could be for their family, and by the time I arrived, I was the first generation who did not pick cotton. And so I was the, I'm the, the you know, I'm their first grandchild um, on that side of my family, the Albany side. And I'm the first one that they knew was not gonna pick cotton. I'm the, I'm the, I'm the like, you know, I just call myself like this wonderful, like beam of light that reflected back to them that they had done what they set out to do. And so I think about those kinds of relationships those, it doesn't have to be your family that you were born into, but those kinds of connections, those kinds of, of, of building up from those kinds of places. The, the place where you know that you are not actually being seen as the incredible bright star contributing being to the planet Earth. 
that you are being called out your name, that you are being displaced as um, the human being that you are and that you are not getting to have the, um, the, the, the respect that breathing beings on planet earth should have for their existence. And I just, I got a very clear message. It was almost like, how dare anybody try to say I don't belong? It's, it was just so clear to me. And so um, I, I didn't, you know, I, I sang since I was three years old. I always been musical. I thought I would do something else. And I end up um, being a musician. It's still the thing when somebody says, you know, what do you do? I say, I'm a musician. But of course I have, I have grown that seed into other possibilities and other ways of, of communicating. And I consider myself a congregational um, art artist. I don't do many things alone. I still try to be like my grandparents were, like a, a, just like they had a lot of kids. So it's like a group of somebody's making something happen. And, um, and I really just consider what I just said piggybacking on what has been said before. So I don't feel necessary to, to cover the same ground. So I gave you more of a personal statement that I feel like if you probably, as we go on on this conversation, you will, you will start to see these, that, that how we are, are kind of uh, together in, in, our, in our being alive in our work. And um, I hope I didn't say, I will pass to um, Her Herve. And did my best with your name, brother. <laughs> Hervé, je ne suis pas sûr si tu as compris, mais elle a, elle a passé la parole à toi. Si ça... um, uh, Hello, je... vous m'entendez? Vous, vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, on t'entend. Alors, euh, alors je, je vois que le, le, le sujet est, est, est très, très, très important, très intéressant parce que euh, je, me vois, je me vois dans, dans, dans l'argument. Euh, je crois que le, le changement est, est en nous et je crois que notre rôle à nous tous qui voulons le changement, c'est de chercher à réaliser ce changement, c'est-à-dire le, le porter au dehors de notre être pour rejoindre les objectifs du changement. Parce que le changement, les justices sociales, ce sont des choses que nous vivons chaque jour. Alors, euh, il ne suffit pas seulement de sentir ce changement euh, en nous, mais devrait aussi pour que ce changement puisse devenir une réalité. Um, I, I translate. Um, I'm, by the way, Milo Rao. I'm in the south of France uh, on the countryside, and that's why you can see me because my connection is a bit weak. Um, and I will translate for uh, Hervé. He says um, he sees absolutely his place in this discussion, and it's, it's very interesting to take part in it. And he thinks that the change uh, is not only something we should observing, but is something that should come out of us, and we should, um, yeah, we should take part in it. Nous, on a eu l'expérience de notre réalité qui s'appelle Casa Santa. C'est-à-dire, nous sommes des gens qui ont vécu euh, euh, l'exploitation dans les champs de tomates. Euh, nous sommes des personnes qui ont euh, qui ont vécu. Euh, je peux dire l'esclavage le, du, du 21e siècle, c'est-à-dire euh, le manque de, euh, de, de droits dans des espaces où nous, où nous avons rêvé, nous, de travailler. Nous sommes des immigrés, je suis en Italie, et euh, on a été confrontés à une situation qui nous a obligés à inventer, nous, l'avenir, ou notre avenir. Um, Hervé, uh... We'll take now the example of the Casa Zancara. That's the institution he leads in uh, in South Italy. You can see it in the film uh, too. 
And this was founded because out of the situation of the farm workers, of the African farm workers in the, in the Italian agriculture in the South, uh, they are living as slaves uh, without any rights, without names, without documents. And that's why they created this institution, he will uh, explain now. Alors, nous sommes arrivés à un, à, à un certain point d'injustice de, de, sociale qui nous a fait savoir, qui nous a fait comprendre que si nous voulons le changement, nous devons nous-mêmes commencer à mettre les jalons de ce changement. Parce que le changement ne viendra jamais de l'oppresseur. Le changement doit naître en nous briser les chaînes qui, qui nous yeah so i had some technical problems to understand uh, he uh, says that the, the situation came to a to a point of social injustice that they understood that they had to take the initiative and to start uh, uh, to implement the change Le changement aussi a besoin d'activités, d'activités réelles, d'activités euh, très, très concrètes. Il ne, il ne suffit pas seulement de, de rêver, parce que nous, nous, nous étions arrivés aussi à un moment tel que nous, comme si même le rêve nous, nous était interdit. Mais on a, on, a, on a cherché à aller au-delà de, 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 du simple rêve pour faire de telle sorte que le changement que nous... Que nous Que nous, que, nous, que nous sentons, que nous voulions, euh, qui est surtout un changement simplement de, de, de situation sociale, de statut social, euh, de sortir d'une situation d'exploité, de, a, vra a vraiment devenu des pr euh, protagonistes euh, de, 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 du changement, de notre propre changement. Yeah, and the situation came to a point that even uh, dreaming about change was somehow forbidden and became impossible, and that's why they they took this initiative of the Casa Sankara that uh, we will, uh, will explain a bit more in detail now. Et, uh, comme nous le savons, dans les luttes, on a toujours besoin d'un point, de, point de, de référence. Et, et dans ce monde-là, il ne manque pas des points de référence. C'est tout simplement des leaders qui peuvent uh, pousser les, 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 les réalités À, à, à atteindre au changement qu'ils aspirent. C'est pourquoi nous, dès, les, dès, nos premières, euh, dès nos premiers pas, on a choisi euh, africain pour, à partir de lui, vraiment marcher sur ce pas pour réaliser ce dont nous voulons. Et nous, nous y sommes arrivés parce qu'aujourd'hui, on a Casa Sankara qui a collé plus de 500 personnes pour leur donner l'opportunité de s'affirmer en tant qu'être humain, humain, en tant que personne faisant partie de la société. So, and what they did, they took the example of uh, Thomas Sankara, uh, very known uh, African leader uh, and politician, and they created the Casa Sankara, uh, an institution where they could uh, house uh, uh, until now 1,600 uh, people, 1,600 refugees. Et je crois que nous tous, on a un rôle très, très important. Le changement que nous voulons est en nous. Mais si nous sommes un peu plus conscients de, de la, de, des membres de notre communauté, que nous, on ne cède pas seulement à la, à la colère ou à la violence, si nous sommes un peu plus éveillés ou un peu plus capables pour porter le changement, alors nous avons cette grande responsabilité d'être vraiment des yeah, and he repeats that taking uh, real measures, real, real change is very important. Uh, Hervé, peut-être tu peux expliquer un peu plus en détail ce que vous faites concrètement dans la Casa Sankara, parce que c'est tellement, c'est tellement uh, inspirant. Ok, alors nous, on a eu l'expérience de voir des ghettos de voir des personnes que nous connaissons qui vivent dans le ghetto, avec un système mafieux, avec la criminalité, organi la, la criminali euh, la criminalité organisée euh, qui, qui réduisait les personnes en esclavage, 
c'est ça le, le, le caporal, c'est-à-dire le système des caporaux. So you have to imagine in South Italy, there's the system of Capolarato, people living in, 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 in slavery reduced to, to live in so-called ghettos, so wild camps under the law of the, of the mafia without any rights. And that's the situation in, uh, in which they, they created the Casa Zancara. Et dit, nous nous sommes levés sans attendre que quelqu'un résolve les problèmes à notre place. Mais nous, on a fait des pas vers les autorités pour leur dire que cette situation peut changer, mais seulement s'il y a une volonté politique qui peut accompagner notre besoin de changement. So what they did, they created the Casa Zancara together with uh, some politicians with the, with the Italian government in the south. C'est pourquoi nous sommes réussis à trouver une structure qui a été abandonnée, que, que nous, on a, on a géré, on a, on a transformé. Aujourd'hui, c'est devenu Casa Sankara, et accolier plus de 500 personnes. Il y a des familles, des, des enfants sont nés là-bas. Et cette, cette réalité donne l'opportunité à ces personnes d'entrer de plein pied dans la société et devenir protagonistes de leur vie. So they found uh, this abandoned structure. You can, by the way, see in the new gospel, the Casa Zankara, they created it. And at this very moment, 500 people is living their families. Uh, children are born there all with rights. And if I can add this, this was also the reason why we were asking Hervé to play Petrus, the guy who uh, creates the church uh, in, the, in, the, in the Bible. Et, uh, puisque... La majeure partie des personnes qui sont accueillies à Casa Sankara ont toujours fait des activités agricoles. Nous, on a mis sur pied un projet d'agriculture et qui nous a permis l'année passée de mettre sur le marché italien un produit de, 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 de conserve de tomates qui s'appelle Riacolto, qui aujourd'hui fait la fierté de Casa Sankara. And it's not only housing people, they also start to be uh, sustainable and to function uh, uh, to produce tomatoes um, and to put these tomatoes on the on the on the market to uh, yeah to be a functioning system. Donc aujourd'hui, on a la possibilité de mettre sur le marché un produit au même titre des gens qui nous ont réduits en esclavage qui aujourd'hui voient notre produit plus cher. So, and that's how uh, um, was realized a very beautiful situation that today they are uh, freed by the same product that was uh, the reason of their slavery, the tomato. So they are on the market with the same prod product that was the reason of their slavery, and that's how they liberated themselves. So they turned the situation around. Donc, je dirais que le changement est possible, et on a toujours, euh, on a toujours le droit de rêver. Ce qu'il ne faut arriver avec les barques en Italie et qui se trouvent dans un jour ou un autre dans des ghettos qui sont euh, escombrés, c'est-à-dire qui sont euh, éparpillés, détruits, etc., etc. Même les baraques qu'ils ont, non, non, ils ne les laissent pas debout. Donc, on a l'impression qu'on a même perdu le droit de rêver. Donc, euh, on a une très grande responsabilité. Nous qui pourrions, qu'on peut être devant comme activistes pour éclairer le chemin à nos frères qui aujourd'hui comptent beaucoup, beaucoup, beaucoup sur notre détermination pour, être, pour, pour changer le cours de leur vie. And uh, that's uh, as a conclusion what makes him think that change is possible. And he thinks that everybody who understood that uh, becomes a kind of a leader, like Thomas Sankara was a leader for them uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the older times. And when these young guys arrive with the boats in Italy from, from, uh, from Africa, and they're reduced to slaves, that's, it's up to them, to Hervé and his friends, 
and other activists to tell them that they can change their life and that it is uh, another system is possible. Merci. Yes. Milo, je crois que je peux m'arrêter là pour ne pas prendre tout le temps. <laughs> okay, so that, that was it. Thanks a lot. Uh, merci beaucoup uh, for the moment. Hello, Giacomo. Christina, would you no, mind introducing oh, yourself? Je dis sure. Que, magari posso, mi posso fermare qua. Per nel caso, But I'm eavesdropping on Hervé's conversation posso, right now. Tu dois, tu dois te mettre muet, Hervé. <laughs> Tu dois, tu dois te... All right, thank you. Okay, oh, sorry. So wonderful to be in your company. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Christina Wong. I am a Yushi, her pronouns, and I uh, am on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Tongva, Chumash, Keech, and Gabrielino people, which has been renamed by settlers as Koreatown in Los Angeles. And I was... Uh, I think it's interesting as I about 12 years ago I wrote an artist statement that specifically said my goal is not to fix the wrongs of the world with easy answers but to make a point of reflection in my work and I've since updated that statement to say okay we can't afford to just reflect anymore we <laughs> we, we need to like fix some stuff and we and I uh and art is just not this hermetically sealed experience that you go into and then you have this, I, I don't think we have that privilege anymore. Or and I actually don't, I kind of question that we ever had the privilege to just experience art in sort of this neutral white space or black box and then proceed about our lives. And why do I say this? Um, uh, I, uh, I, a lot of my work looks like one person shows uh, where I play a character named Christina Wong, that's my name. And, and I'm uh, often based on sort of things I've done in my real life. Uh, and I, I have this sort of martyr complex, which plays out in these characters that I play. And in these shows, I set out to like fix this, I'm gonna do this, gonna fix this. And, and inevitably it's, it's much more complicated and becomes a whole thing. And that, that's sort of, I think the running theme in a, in a lot of my pieces and in my life is that I, I always underestimate how complicated things will be. So um, a few years ago, I, I found myself um, unable to satirize myself as a character, uh, satirize myself as sort of a naive activist character. And I say this because I actually had a reality TV pilot, which I had pitched while Obama was still president. And this and True TV bought this pilot, and the premise of this television show was that I was going to sort of prank people to care about social justice. Um, the election didn't turn out the way, uh, at least me and my little head bubble had thought it was going to happen. And nothing about this character made sense. Um, I felt like I realized very quickly I was. A, a liability to everything I cared about, that that satire had died because literally we live in this, in living satire, um, that, that to, to, to make it on top of, like it's almost so hard to, to out prank what feels like a giant prank that's being placed upon us, which is our realities, right? And, and I was like, oh my God, as a performance artist that used to do these crazy wacky things, uh, I feel like I'm out of a job. I feel like artists and politicians have switched jobs. They're now the ones who are creating shock and spectacle. And, and we're the ones as artists who are left trying to create social change to fix this. Um, I don't know if anyone's observed just like watching late night uh, during the pandemic, how, how I feel like comedians like are the most earnest people that I can actually trust to hear the news and commentary from. And so I decided to run for public office and then I thought that would be my, my new project. And so it was called Christina Wong for public office. I had no idea what the hell I was doing because I always thought I was too Googleable to like run for anything. Um, uh, but you know, nothing seems to matter because <laughs> much worse people have been elected. And I, I ran in two small elections. It's a very expensive process to, to run, especially in a city like LA. And I, I ended up uh, winning a seat on my neighborhood council with 72 votes total, if you count the vote that I cast for myself. 
Um, and a lot of that was because I basically waved people down outside the gym where there was an election and begged them to go in and check my name off and, and, and use what Spanish I've retained from high school and uh, my restaurant Korean to like, I'm not, I'm not Korean, but like, you know, like it was, it was like, this is how people get elected folks, right? Like <laughs> a charming smile outside a polling place. And, um, and I've created work about this. I created a rally show called Christina Wong for Public Office. I, uh, I sewed the seal, which I just took down. Um, this is a, my, my elected seal, it's all folded up, but you've got like tampons and stuff instead of the, oh, there we go. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's my seal. And I'll get back to stuff I've so, but um, yeah, I mean, it was like, I, I serve, I'm, I'm like, I'm shocked when I'm on my neighborhood council that I'm not the only performance artist on this neighborhood council because everyone is so crazy. And, and, uh, <laughs> and I'm like, how are you not, do how is this not a bit? How are you like this all the time? And, and like, how, I'm, how am I not actually sitting inside this long, boring, durational, dystopic piece about our lives? This is actually, oh, no, no, this is real life. Um, and I've, I've definitely seen sort of the limits of government and it's frustrating. It's frustrating to get anything done on a local level. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm really understanding where artists can help fill in the gap for that. Uh, so basically I was set to tour Christina Wong for public office uh, all last year before the pandemic. And um, uh, I had sewn all these beautiful sets. And of course the pandemic hit and all artists were deemed not essential. And I was like, oh God, this is like the most relevant timely show of my life that was going to get people out to vote, that would get people thinking about the political process. And now I can't even tour it. Um, because everyone will die at my rally. Not that that stopped some politicians in America from holding rallies, right? And uh, and I was sort of sitting with this thought how non-essential I was as an artist. And I started sewing masks because we had a, um, a mask shortage in hospitals, right? And uh, and I was I, I I'd sewn vagina costumes. I've sewn you know the set and stuff, but I've never sewn medical equipment. And uh, that exploded, like I very naively offered to the world, I'll, I'll I, like, let me sew you a mask if um, you're immunocompromised. And I would like to also say the sewing skills I have come from my grandparents and my mother who came to, my, my grandparents um, came to America and they work in the garment industry. And, um, and that was a survival skill that they brought with them. So uh, I was getting very terrifying messages uh, from people who were nurses and uh, doctors who needed masks. And I started a group on Facebook to see if I could get some help. And I called it Auntie Sewing Squad, not realizing her acronym was ASS. And uh, we are still sewing and distributing masks 16 months later. And I sort of describe us as like, oh, this is what it would look like if a performance artist ran FEMA, which is our, um, for the translator, our federal emergency. I mean, I don't, we don't even know what, what does FEMA stand for, Carlton? Do you know? Anyway, but. <laughs> federal <laughs> Emergency <laughs> Management <laughs> Association. Yeah. Agency. Yes. AKA, where, AKA, where, where is FEMA? Where has FEMA freaking been this last year? Because basically we went from sewing a few masks to doing relief vans headed to the Navajo Nation, to doing relief drives to Standing Rock. These, uh, uh, and we, we transitioned um, in about a month from sewing just for medical workers to all these communities in America that just don't have access to running water, to living wage. Um, so that was farm workers, that was undocumented immigrants, that was migrants at the Southern border seeking asylum. Um, these were very poor communities of color in fence line communities that had high toxic waste. And like, it's all the communities that we were sewing for, if you look at all of them, what they have in common is they were all communities that had like systemically, or historically borne the brunt of, of systemic racism and, and structural violence. And, um, and so anyway, I, I, as an artist, I feel like this was, I didn't intend for this to be a project. It started as very patriotic and then began to feel very political. And I feel like so much of how this group of strangers nationally um, 
over 800 aunties all over the country has kept going this long. Some have retired and some have stopped. And is that we have this whole system of, of care um, that we were, uh, that we're very explicit about this being political work. There were a lot of sewing groups who were like, oh, this isn't about politics, it's just about sewing. I'm like, no, it's not. Like we're doing this because the government failed, failed us. Um, and, uh, but, but it's, I think a lot of it is because there are a lot of artists in our group and we have, we, we understood in the beginning that like capitalism failed us, that like we couldn't buy our way out of the situation of this pandemic. And people kept donating money to me thinking this would make us so faster. And it's, there weren't even materials to buy. Um, so what needed to happen is we had to, had to locate people who could sew. We had to build strong communities. We had to build a supportive community. And that was um, because a lot of the, the people sewing in our group, they have ways to make money. Um, so they weren't doing this because they were hoping to make money from this, but because of the community that it gave them to be part of this community in this very crisis time, right? To feel like you have purpose and connection and can support other people who need your support. And so that has been our staying power as a group. And, uh, and very much, I, I think this whole pandemic, this project, um, I've also done projects with undocumented immigrants and um, uh, formerly incarcerated uh, Asian Pacific Islander Americans. And I, I'm, I'm very much like feeling that this kind of work that I do as an artist has to be the shift. It's not just something pretty to look at or entertaining, but it's like, and it's why I love this, um, the, the artist statement that your company put out um, because I, I, I've, I, I have questions about how it gets financed, but that's enough. <laughs> maybe that's me in America asking that question. But um, yeah. Milo, could you introduce yourself? Ah, uh, yeah. Hi. Uh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much for for having us here uh, again. I'm unfortunately invisible because my my uh, my connection is too weak. So yeah. So I'm here in in, in south of France uh, on the countryside between France and Italy and um, in the very west of France or in the very east of Italy and in the very south of Europe. And um, I, um, I, 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 I think most of uh, perhaps what I can say about, about uh, how, we, how we try to make changes is, is, uh, is in the film because I think you can only work through, I don't know how, I mean, for me, it was very inspiring what, for example, Carlton Turner said just uh, in, the, in the beginning of this conversation that uh, he was talking about social institutions and what they, what they are. And, uh, and Hervé talked about uh, his institution, the Casa Sankara, he created as a, as a, as a kind of a, of, a, of a place where people, practice change uh, in, a, in, a, in a kind of in a whole uh, economy, so to say. And um, yeah, so that's, that's why uh, for me, that's, that's quite interesting project. And uh, yeah, so perhaps, but I, I, I would like, I would just give the, the, perhaps to go a bit deeper, I would, I would like to give, uh, or to ask back Hervé, uh, to explain a bit more. Uh, I think it could be interesting what, uh, um, uh, the film and uh, the revolt of dignity and the Casa Sankara, how these uh, work together for him, how 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 this worked for his uh, community, and what was uh, what was the outcome? So before Irvi speaks, I, I wanted to just point out that parallel to the filming of the um, of the of the film the new gospel that there was an entire um, political campaign called the revolt of dignity that was um, that 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 happened alongside and then became part of the the film as well it's pointing out to viewers that may have seen the film or may not have seen the film Sì, appunto, eh, eh, la rivolta della dignità è stato un, 
Et le moment, français, c'est s'il te plaît. Hervé, parle pas en français pour moi. Excuse-moi. Ok. Oui. Je disais que la révolte de la dignité a été un moment très intense. Euh, qui, a, qui, qui nous a fait prendre conscience de notre responsabilité devant à, à, aux, aux, aux exigences de notre communauté. Et Hervé, il y a eu des problèmes techniques, je ne t'ai pas vraiment compris. Euh, tu peux répéter euh, Excuse-moi. Si je, je dis, si je disais que la révolte de la dignité a été au moment très intense euh, durant, durant la réalisation du film. Parce que ces moments-là nous ont fait prendre conscience de notre grande responsabilité devant à notre communauté. Oui, yeah, he, 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 he says that the revolt of dignity, which was a, a kind of a network or a connection, a political campaign for the rights of, uh, of refugees uh, and the documentation of refugees, Uh, uniting 40 organizations and also the Casa Sankara uh, was a, a very intense moment, but also a, a moment of becoming conscious of the, of the important role they have to play in this change. Okay. Parce que ce moment-là n'est pas un moment qui a été répété comme des acteurs qui jouent dans un film. Ce sont des moments qu'on a vécu. Et ces moments nous ont permis de mettre les points sur les i pour dire exactement aux autorités ce que nous voulons et qu'est-ce que nous attendons des politiques d'intégration. And uh, this was also a moment of, 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 of strong politicisation, a moment when they understood, okay, we can directly say to the political authorities what we need and and, and uh, yeah, and, and that we need it now. So a moment of change. Uh, Hervé, uh, uh, on me demande aussi dans le chat, uh, comment c'était d'être dans le film aussi, comme, même comme acteur? Alors toi, comme activiste, ce, ce mélange d'acteur, d'activisme, c'était comment? I ask him, because I'm asked in the chat to go a bit deeper in the, into the, how it was mixing art and activism, because he's not only in the film as the leader of the, of the Casa Zankara, he's also in the film of, in the role of, of, of Peter, of Saint Peter. Uh, et toi qui es même musulman, <laughs> alors qu'il est, c'est, c'est encore une, une autre, un autre niveau. Alors, je dirais que moi-même, j'ai été surpris par ma personne de, 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 de découvrir comment toutes ces choses-là sont liées. Que à la fin, je ne me suis pas senti comme un acteur, mais comme un acteur d'une réalité que moi, je suis en train de vivre, une réalité réelle. So he says uh, that in the end, he was uh, surprised of himself. Uh, And he didn't have the impression that he was uh, playing as an actor in it. He was more kind of realizing the reality, the situation he was in inside the, the project, he, he says. Donc la chose n'était pas que si j'étais musulman ou si j'appartenais à Casa Sankar ou si j'étais un, 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 un cultivateur, un travailleur. Il s'agissait de parler de la condition humaine. Et ça, ça va au-delà des appartenances. And he insists saying, even if he's, if he, he's Muslim and uh, his part, if he wouldn't be Muslim or is he Muslim, if he is Muslim as he is, or if he is a part of the Casa Sankara, or if he would only be a, a simple farm worker, it is a film about the human condition. And that's, uh, that's for him the, the, the central point. Quand il s'agit de conditions humaines, tu crois que les appartenances tombent tous. Parce qu'on met la personne, la dignité de la personne au devant de la scène et c'est ça qui compte. Yeah, and when it's about uh, the human condition, about the dignity of the, of the human being, then your uh, individual faith or individual where you come from, etc., is not important anymore. Ce film a été pour nous non seulement, non seulement un, un réveil, parce que ça nous a montré combien est grande notre responsabilité pour, pour diriger nos communautés, 
Mais ce film nous a permis aussi de s'ouvrir, de, de, de comprendre en fait que notre réalité non est seulement une réalité nôtre, mais hein, une réalité qui appartient à tout le monde. And for him, the film uh, was two things. On the one hand, it was for him like a, a wake up call to say, okay, we have to go, uh, we have to go somehow public. We have to fight for, uh, for our situation. On the other hand, he, through the film, he also understood that it was not only the problem of his community in this, in this part of Italy, but it, it's a universal problem, the situation they are in. Les connaissances qu'on a eues durant la réalisation euh, de ce film nous ont permis de, de réaliser concrètement des projets qu'on avait dans notre communauté. On a réalisé des, 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 des ateliers de tailleur, on a réalisé des, des ateliers de musique et ça nous a permis aussi de, de, de mettre en avant la production agricole qu'on a toujours rêvé de faire. So, and for them, this, this film project was a, was a starting point uh, to change the community. To, now they produce uh, agricultural pro products like, like tomatoes, what he said before. They uh, produce clothes. So uh, all these things were uh, kind of uh, started through these new uh, connections that were built through this, uh, through this revolt and, and, uh, and, uh, and the production of the film. Et depuis lors, les personnes viennent de, de partout pour connaître la réalité de Casé Central. Et ça nous permet aussi d'agrandir notre champ d'activité et ensemble de savoir qu'il est possible de rêver ensemble. Et quand nous sommes ensemble pour écrire l'histoire, la plupart du temps, on réussit à rejoindre nos objectifs. So what happens uh, after the distribution of the film? Uh, which is distributed in cinemas in, in, in almost whole Europe, uh, that people from everywhere now come to Casa Zankara to, to see what happens there. And it became an example to, to, uh, yeah, of the possibility of change and how to dream uh, together, he says. I think that the... <laughs> That's it, he says. Thank you so much, um, because I really do think that the film is such an incredible example of um, how we build solidarity between art and movements and how um, artistic expression becomes part of movements in more provocative ways than just being, um, you know, sort of the decoration or, or the entertainment in, in a protest. And so it becomes this way of like, how do we begin to define our worlds and what they look like? And, and, um, and in that way, um, as Toshi was, was saying in the beginning, our, our art and our activism, our art, our organizing, they're not separate. They're, they are a way of life. They're a way that we move in the world. And the second point of Nilo's manifesto is that theater is not a product it's a it's a production process it's a process and so i'm curious um and toshi I, i'm gonna hand this question to you i'm curious as to um uh, folks to talk a little bit more about how their processes mirror worlds that we imagine and i just think about the work that you've done most recently toshi with um with the um adaptation or the, the response to Octavia Butler's book and um, in and, and all the multiple ways in which you developed it so that there's podcasts and there's conversations and there's you know all sorts of things that are happening and they look different in every community that you go to. And so as you take Parable of the Sower, you really continue to grow community. And so I would love for you to talk about that a little bit more. Sure, thank you. Um, I think with this particular uh, work, Octavia E. Butler's Parable of the Sower and Parable of the Talents, um, which are these novels um, that Octavia Butler wrote. Um, so the first book was the Parable of the Sower and the second book was the um, Parable of the Talents and, the, and um, 
really quickly. They emanate from um, a community right outside of Los Angeles and they take place in the year 2000, they start in the year 2024. But she was like researching um, probably in the late 80s, early 90s, and they came out, I think, 93, and then one came out, nine, the second one came out in 97. And there was supposed to be a third one called Parable of the Trickster. And, um, and I think, you know, this, this, this is a, a work that basically, you know, when I read it, I didn't, you didn't, it never got on in like New York Times bestsellers list or something like that. Um, but it is, it, it's a very, it has traveled so well over time. Like it is taught, um, you know, all over the U S and in multiple, um, schools and it's become a, a manifesto um, in itself. Um, people use it in multiple kinds of ways. Uh, a lot of people use it in terms of, of um, you know, uh, doing revolutionary work, organizations use it and um, other, uh, you know, Adrienne Marie Brown has written um, emergent strategy and other texts that are reflective of this work and so, we, my mother and I, Bernice Johnson Regan, we were, we've been working on getting this to uh, inside of theaters or theaters outside, <laughs> whatever theaters we could get it for 20 years. Um, and, uh, and Octavia's work, it's very surprising, but Octavia's work hadn't come off of the pages. So we are the first to take her work off the pages, which we're really proud of. And the reason why we're proud of it is because we know we sit inside of a community of, of people, scholars, artists, medicine people, like you name it, um, food justice practitioners, all kinds of people who are interested in looking at the human's trajectory on planet earth and our collaboration with life on earth and the planet herself or the planet itself and then seeing ourselves inside of the larger universe and this manifests in so many ways we don't even have time to talk about it but what i knew right away was that i wasn't going to be doing like a traditional theatrical thing of like let me raise a million dollars and then let me like workshop for five years and then let me do shows let's have one on you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and a matinee on Saturday and a matinee, whatever that structure is. I was like, that's not going to happen. Um, and, uh, and it really didn't. It is, it, I knew it was going to be a tool inside of the communities that it landed in. And that part of my job would be showing up and asking people who wanted to work on a path. And that is my question. I show up, you know, I try to show up a year before um, the show gets gets anywhere. And I try to have some resources when I come. So I'm like actually supporting um, community as I come in and, and I ask people, do you all wanna work on a path? And usually this is work they're already doing. So I'm trying not to say do something new unless they want to. It is, it is completely different everywhere we go. And the actual, centering of the performance it's never been the same twice it's always changed and sometimes i i change i take out songs i put in <laughs> other ones um some communities have insisted that they need to be actually a part of it and so we have figured out ways for that to happen uh, some communities have taken over the theatrical space and decided that the whole thing from when somebody walks in to when they leave has to be a ritual of some kind. Like every everywhere we go, it is different. And this idea of um, United States and, and the, the border lines of states and cities and things like that and the, the limitations of, of, um, of language and access, we have been able to like using this work, bring, bring different people together, uh, government people, uh, libraries, schools, people, people, and do um, do things that are of service 
and of, I think, reflection of who people are in these spaces. And that take, and that, and that, again, I think it's want to really say strongly that I don't ask people to create new work with me. Like, I'm not, I'm not like going in and saying, can y'all do something for me? I'm actually being like, y'all know Octavia. I know Octavia. What can we do with this here? Or you've already been working on, on this. And some people have never heard of the book, but everybody knows the conditions. Everybody knows what, what this story is saying. And, and, you know, this story looks at a future that we're already in, because here we are um, very close. And the reason why um, Octavia now has hit the New York Times bestsellers list, and now there are multiple television shows and movies is because her trajectory was so on point. From, from writing 30 years ago, um, she named everything that was going to happen and she didn't think it was magic. She was like, if you can get over your fear, you can ask yourself the question, what's next? And then you can say what's going to happen next. And that that's a gift that being able to, to be, to, to put your fear down and ask the question, what is next will help you create the solutions or will help you create um, even if all you're creating is your safe passage through a very dangerous things, she considered that very necessary. And so what we're doing when we go to these communities is we are embracing the what's next that everybody already knows. And we are supporting that knowledge and we're supporting the solutions that come out of it. And even if the solutions are like, we will survive through this so we can get to the next thing, we're supporting that. Um, and so somewhere in there, we all sing together and we tell the story <laughs> and we are in a theater and tickets are sold. And I could tell a whole other story about how innovative, um, these, these different presenters have taken to this because the people who have presented it, cause it's not everybody. I, I didn't make a, you know, perfect piece coming out of the box. I practically debuted it, workshopping it, and I insisted it had to debut in 2017 because I was like, we are late and we have to have these conversations. And I got a lot of support and love <laughs> from you know, some brilliant people to carry on because I actually also produce it and I have never produced theater in my life. So it just, it, it's, it's that same energy that people are talking about on this panel that you're doing something you've never done, but you have such an incredible, you know, understanding and knowledge of who you are and what and where you can be. And, you know, the, it is so, it's so important for us to do this in so many ways. And, um, I'll stop here because I'll start talking about the generational conversations and I'll start talking about all of the, the ways that people have taken a book that's not for children, but pulled the, the aspects out of it that they know children can identify with. And so we end up having a conversation with a very full um, expansion of, of people everywhere we go. And it is a, it is a continuous Thing. I, don't, I don't even do like outreach stuff where you come in for two days and then you do something magical and then you leave. I'm like, I'm coming now and then I'm going to be back in three months and then I'm going to come back. And we've had to adapt to COVID. Um, and that's been interesting because um, we, we got shut down like everybody else, but we tried to keep the path going. Thank you, Toshi. A, a very similar question, Dred. I would love for you to also talk about process, particularly with the slave revolt rebellion, slave revolt rebellion, and um, and and what you learned through that process, and what what you think others may have learned through that process. Yeah, um, I definitely want to talk about process a bit, and I also want to bookmark kind of a question to come back to Toshi and Milo and Hervé a little bit about. Um, 
Well, I'll put part of the question out and then I'll finish. I'll come back to it after talking about process because it somewhat relates. But it, to, Toshi, um, I mean, one of the things, and I've read the parable of the talents more recently than the parable of the sower, but one of the things is that, that A, there's a sharp critique of evangelical Christianity within the books and how it's being applied in uh, American public. Uh, but also there's an invention of a, a new religion of which I believe she, Octavia Butler says, God is change. Um, or, um, and so, and, and with, with sort of taking a book and, and applying it, making work out of it with community, but then it, in a way it's similar to, to the new gospel or the, um, sorry, I'm, I'm terrible with name, but, but with Milo where you're, you're sort of taking the, the story of Jesus and then trying to 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 apply that to migrant workers, and the, but the, were the two different? I mean, one's taking like, okay, let's try and reclaim the Christian story, and the other is the Christian story is the problem. We need a whole different religion or a whole different story. So I want to come. So that's sort of where I would like to talk a little bit about. But I'm but I will answer the question of community and process because slave rebellion reenactment. The the story that I took and was trying to tell was there was this rebellion that happened in 1811 where enslaved people realized the only way they could actually get free was not to escape and not to just endure slavery, which a lot of people did, not to just escape individually, not even to escape collectively and form maroon colonies, which many people did, but they had to overthrow the system of enslavement and set up a new society where slavery would be outlawed. That was a really radical vision. And I wanted to sort of tell that story and talk with people and collect and say, present to people in the, in the community, because this happened, the, the rebellion happened in 1811 out in New Orleans and outside of New Orleans. And I live in New York, which is a, for an international audience is over a thousand miles away. And so I was not part of the community that, that existed there. And so I went down and was talking with people and it was a community engaged performance. We didn't hire just a bunch of actors. We actually, over the process of about six and a half years, I talked with people and, 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 and there was conversations with 21st century people about why this 19th century history of freedom and emancipation matters. And collectively we built this reenactment. Um, and one of the things that, that you know, of the, the, the process was in 1811, a man named Charles DeLons, who was, was one of the key leaders of this rebellion, he went from plantation to plantation because he had relative freedom of movement and he recruited people who became his lieutenants and they in turn recruited other people. And so under the threat of death and death of friends and family, people clandestinely organized and plotted this rebellion. And so using that as a map, I was like, okay, I will talk with a relative handful of people. I will have people introduce me to the people who need to be part of this. I will talk with them and then they will in turn recruit other people. And so it was a long, mostly word of mouth, mostly not on the internet process of like p having one-on-one -on -one conversations with why we should do this reenactment and how it was going to be done. What could we learn from that past and how does that apply in the present and how do people in the present become ambassadors for freedom and what does that tell us today? And what what is this realization that the only way to get free is by overthrowing a system of enslavement? What does that tell us today? I mean, because a lot of my radical friends were looking at what well, we want change but it's like, but, and then there's the, but we can't do X, Y, and Z. And these people who are facing really tremendously harsh conditions of enslavement said, well, we actually have to figure out, and we, we know the problems were enslaved. The solution is to end slavery and to overthrow the system of enslavement. How do we do the heavy work to figure out how we could successfully launch a rebellion and, and overthrow the system of slavery? And, and so if they could do that in 1811, and work with maroon communities to pass messages and work with other people to, to organize and plot and march as a disciplined army and figure out how we could seize the fort in New, in, in, on the gates of New Orleans to have weapons so that people, when they got down out of the plantations, could seize the city. What, what does that teach us about how we can organize a reenactment and artwork today? And so this question of building with community and actually reaching out to all sorts of people um, to make the costumes, to, to figure out more about the story, to learn about who needed to participate, to reach out to different communities, because there was, spontaneously we had okay ties amongst various sections of the black community, but I knew that indigenous people, particularly the Homa people, were participant in 1811, and I wanted, well, how do we meet people like that today? Um, and, and so we had to, you know, given the divisions that exist within U.S. society, it's sort of hard to, to just spontaneous. If you just work where you already know, you're not going to have the alignment of people that you want. And, 
And so we had to, to meet new people and, and invite people in. And then there were complicated conversations because at a time of sort of, you know, I mean, this is, you know, prior to George Floyd, but Black Lives Matter was in the house. And some people were like, man, why are these like, you know, native people here? This is a black thing. And it's like, no, it ain't. It's about getting free. And historically there were indigenous people that were supportive of it. We want to welcome that, but it also has implications for the present. Um, and so coming back to this question of both religion and community, I would love for Milo and Toshi to talk about sort of, you know, how the, how you take these historic texts, one being, you know, a several hundred and arguably several thousand year old text and the other being a 30 year old text and bring it to community and say, well, what can we mine from that? And then within that, it's like, what, what does it mean? I mean, how does one look at a time when there's a rise in religious fundamentalism that is causing tremendous harm, be it you know, Christian fundamentalism or, or Islamic fundamentalism or you know, Hindu fundamentalism, how do we actually at that time talk about you know, what, what does religion mean and what does it mean to take these texts and then try and bring life into them in a, a different way? Um, and yeah, so. You're muted, you're muted. I was uh, I was thinking Milo go first, um, but all right. Um, I would just say you know the way I looked at the you know this is a great question, and um, you know there's when we did the opera and we were tracking the conditions you know we use spirituals, and um, so there's, there's a lot of spirituals in our work, and. Um, you know, this, the, the spirituals are the songs that, you know, our ancestors made while they were, um, you know, enduring slavery, um, getting out of slavery, running away from slavery. They're very, very full of information, full of details, full of, you know, directions by the stars, full of, of coded messaging to escape. Um, and so we thought that that would be a really, a, that would apply. And, he, and, and one of the things is that like, even though her work is 30 years old, we, I just saw like um, the, the, the young person that starts this new religion is 15 years old. And her father is, um, is 55 years old and he's a Baptist minister. And so I was able to use, you know, my own family, my mother, dad was a, my grandfather's a Baptist minister. And so out of his mouth came the spirituals at the beginning of the show. And then where, where, so we wanted to like old, you know, our ancestors old text and not necessarily the Bible, but our ancestors creation of sacred text out of what was available for them. And so I always say like, you know, they took this scripture and made something that could um, be applied to their wellness. And, and they used it to tell the stories they needed to tell in order to either survive or get free or both at the same time. And so it fits really well inside of this story because the same thing is happening in this story. Um, a, a new, a new, you know, spirit, a 15 year old girl is divining a text in order to like survive a situation that is just so out of control that few people survive. And she's saying she's using like she's making her own, she's making her own scripture and these parables. And what she sees is that change is the one thing that will always happen change is, is the one thing that we're, we, we have to live with. Um, and she says, you can shape change and through shaping change, you shape God. And so it just didn't feel so far away to, from spirituals to me, you know, spirituals were adaptable. Spirituals existed be, before, be, existed inside of slavery. They existed outside of, of slavery and they, um, and they became adaptable 
to the situations where people were like having to risk their lives and they told you everything you needed. And I think Octavia intentionally did that same thing with young um, Lauren Alamina, who I think she aligned with Jesus. You know, here are two like entities inside of a, you know, an, a horrific situation who are not supposed to survive and who are not supposed to, to, to even, you know, think about creating movement and they both do. Um, so it was, it was easy for us to, to, you know, mind the spirituals, but then because we're moving through time and we're telling an Afro-futuristic story, um, one of the things we tried to do is have the music shift out of, shift, I find spirituals foundational to everything, but we wanted to shift sonically through um, the generations of, of sonic transportation by Black people in this country. So that the, the further we go in the story, the more that Lauren Alameda finds her voice, the music starts to meet the times that we're in right now. And the messaging starts to meet the times that we're in right now. And so that, that um, kind of, you know, we get away without having the conflict um, be a sonic conflict because it all makes sense to me that, that our people use the text of the Bible to tell a story is not a conflict to me. However, when it is time for Lauren Alamina to wake up her community and say, we got to go, she is gonna fight her father, the minister on his text. She's gonna, she's gonna say, you know, actually that's not gonna work here. And even the sacred text of we shall not be moved, you know, which is an anthem of the civil rights movement, she is like, that doesn't work anymore. Not only are we gonna be moved, but it's a matter of how we are gonna be moved. And it is up for us to make a determination about that. And so I think Octavio is very aggressively saying, I have this whole world, I have all of it. And out of the whole world of all of this, what is a story I can tell that gives us the most access to like what I wanna call our whole beings, like the wings on our back that we can't see, you know, the other parts of our brain that we don't use um, to acknowledge our fear um, and move instead of sit in denial to believe what we know. And she used everything she had in order to kind of move us towards that. Milo, do we still have you to speak to this question? It's very interesting to have a Marxist director direct this <laughs> yeah. film. Um, what, what, yeah, I, I, I would really like to, thank you. Uh, what exactly is the question? Um, well, the question I sort of asked was to talk about using, um, I mean, it was about religion and using sort of text to create new work. And so in the case of, of um, Toshi, she, she created a work out of the, the parable of the sower and the parable of the talents, the Octavia Butler work, which part of the, the, the work um, has a very sharp critique of uh, Christian fundamentalism, but also the creation of a new religion um, in which the, the creators in community create a religion, part of the basis of which is God is change, but you could shape change. And then you use the Bible as as the creation foundation for creating a new work in the the you know the Jesus in 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 your work that is connecting with with migrant laborers is different than at least how fundamentalist Christians are using the Bible right now, which I think that there's a we're we're all making work at a time when religious fundamentalism is causing great harm. Um, but then how you're choosing to 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 you know, sort of try and look at bringing new life and a different approach to that um, is something I wanted to just sort of talk about because where one book was like, okay, we have to throw out this Christian Christianity because it's causing harm. The basis that you said, well, no, we can actually take Christianity and look at how it might apply today. And and particularly as a Marxist, what, how are you thinking about, about that? And, and what, what, 
why one might need religion, because as Marx, you know, said is like religion is the opiate of the masses, but he also said it's the heart of a heartless world, which was paraphrasing from the Bible. And so, um, yeah, just talking about religion, art, and foundational text for creating new work. Ah, uh, yeah, I, I uh, thank you a lot for for explaining. Um, I, I I have the impression somehow you have to be a Marxist to understand uh, the, the the Bible and especially the New Testament because there's a big problem and we, we we already discussed yesterday about it that this book was as you know appropriated by an institution that is the church and I think we uh, and perhaps it's for all uh, myths and texts we have to reappropriate it and I think it's very important to see who does reappropriate these texts and strangely when you when you read the 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 New Testament, it's it's a book about uh, a revolt against the Roman occupation at that moment and and the elites that are collaborating, the economic elites that are collaborating at that moment with the Roman Empire, um, and strangely this book this revolt against. Uh, the government or the system, you could say, was then appropriated by the system as a story to kind of give metaphors of how you could make a, a, a spiritual life inside the system and going along with it without changing it. So it came, became a kind of, as you said, it the uh, opium des Volkes, as, as Marx says, the opium of the of the of the people. And that's exactly what it became. And that's why it is necessary to reappropriate it and to kind of find again the foundations of it and uh, the, the revolutionary input of this book. And that's what we, what we, what we, and I mean, many people that reread the book and the, in the, for example, the whole theology of the liberation, um, the, what, what, what we tried uh, with this book. And of course, another, um, access we have to it is is one access uh, or another perspective we, we have on that book is is a universal one so a kind of a paulinian lecture of it uh rv is an example but i think most of the apostles or of the actors activists playing the film are uh, non-believers or muslims or for example now my personally i'm, a, I'm an atheist i was raised as a catholic but then as a, as a uh, i became atheist and and others are um, most of them are muslims for example are believers uh, ivan sanier is, a, is a, he's a catholic believer uh, but we have all kind of people and i think the last point of view but is for me quite interesting when you really look inside the book uh, I can't, then you, it's difficult to understand how it could become this propaganda book of the mega machine, of the capitalist mega machine that was invading the whole world, because it's a book about failure. It's a book about the problems of revolt. It's a book even about solidarity, the beauty of solidarity, but also the problems of solidarity. Because the problem that Jesus has is that he's denied by, by Peter, for example, that's the role that Hervé plays, a very beautiful, metaphor about friendship under the pressure uh, of the state. And, uh, and uh, um, you have the Judas story. So you have a, a very, uh, very clear uh, uh, story about the problems of a, of, a, of, a, of a little revolutionary group and how this little group functions under the pressure of, of the system. So that's what, what, what's happening in the book. And of course, when you when you look at at how we staged it and we had a lot of discussions about it of course a lot of the transcendental side that is very important in the interpretation of the church is out in in my view for example there is no resurrection in in our book for us the resurrection is what you can see in the end credits is the distribution of the tomatoes is the reinstallment but the real reinstallment of, of of dignity in the in for example the Casa de la Dignita in the house of dignity is a uh, is this kind of a message that becomes reality and not a transcendental um uh, payoff that is is very important in the lecture of the bible that would not realize it uh, the revolutionary input of the bible but would try to kind of export it somewhere after death you know so that's that's this um, 
so we did a we did a quite uh, uh, Marxist lecture of the book. I think one one thing that is 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 quite important to to say that we also try to do a, a structural uh, lecture of it. And I think Hervé was uh, was mentioning it when he was saying, but one thing that we wanted to make understand, and I think that's what art always does, and that what perhaps religion does is you have to realize it in a very concrete context. And the more concrete the context is, the more you understand the universalism of the, of the message and how structural it is. For example, one really touching thing for me was that a lot of people in the film sometimes don't know if they are in the documentary part or in the fictional part, because the words of the Bible are, are somehow so real uh, because the system didn't change in the 2000 last years, you know? For example, in the very beginning, when Ivan Sanier goes to this uh, first refugee camp, there's a woman coming to him and saying, uh, his, I think it's in the, in the, in the first five minutes, um, I am the mother and the father of a child. And then he says, aha, if it's like this, and if the child is born in Italy, you have right to papers. And of course, this is, of yeah. course, a metaphor, a metaphoric scene for the birth of Jesus, but you don't feel it because it seems like documentary. So we are living in the exactly same uh, problems of documentation, of regularization, of in slavery, of, of, of all the things that are described in the Bible. And it's my interest in the book, not a transcendental interest. Of course, there are moments of of beauty, of, of cinematography, of, of the beauty of solidarity, the beauty of Hello. The landscape. Can, can I ask a question? Um, I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> but I saw us all nodding at the moment where you had described that some people could not tell if they're in the documentary or the film. And one of the moments that strikes me is when um, the Italian, I think he's the labor organizer. He says, I'm not trying to make a movie here. And uh, and I love that moment because that is a tension that has sometimes happened when I've worked in communities. They're like, they're tr they, they ultimately are working on the activist movement. I've come to do a theater project with them, but maybe I've pushed too hard and uh, pushed someone emotionally to a place they don't want to go. Or um, now they're feeling like they're a, they're a subject and not uh, a subject of a documentary or not. And, and can you describe those? those tensions and I would love for the other artists on the panel to also chime in like especially dread like when I heard about your project I was like I wonder how many people were completely triggered by that and I, I have I heard a few stories about like people who just were like what is happening when they watch the slave rebellion like go by their front door so I'm wondering how 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 do we deal with those tensions as as artists um you know, at what point do we go, okay, okay, I'll back off making the art part so you can do your job. Yeah, that's, I mean, we, of course, in the film, we underline these tensions uh, because uh, again, for me, the New Testament is a book about exactly the same tensions that you describe. And for example, if you take this trade unionist, um, for him, this Revolta della Dignita was problematic because of course, what we tried to do was to bring together the problems of the of the Italian farm workers, uh, which were represented by Gianni Fabris, who is a is a kind of an old style trade unionist, uh, the guy I have the problems with, you know, this this older uh, Italian guy. And on the other hand, you have the uh, you have the sex workers, you have the the farm workers from all kind of African countries living in the south of Italy. And of course, only if they unite, uh, it would work out. For example, uh, RV works together with the Italian government, for example. So all these kind of, of solidarities are quite difficult. And, um, and that's what you can see in the film in, 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 uh, in many moments as, for example, of course, when you have a, a, a um, how to say, for example, what the film was doing, uh, I think the balance in between the classic trade unionism represented by Gianni Fabris was always on the side of the white farm workers. And perhaps the project of the Revolta della Dignità was the first one pushed a bit by the film where the balance went more to the refugee organizations. And it was the first, first time that, for example, I mean, this, this kind of conflict was, was provoked when the Italian television comes 
And then only Ivan Sanye is invited to talk and not Gianni Fabris. And for 20 years, it was, of course, the other way around that uh, the, the white trade unionists would, would talk and, and the others would listen. And this was at, at that time that it turns around and it was in this context that this conflict came up. And I think that's the, it's, it's much less be, between uh, art and activism in that time, it, uh, in, that, in that scene, it's more about the tensions that you can, can have in a, in a, in a kind of a, of, a, of a social fight between the different groups in it. But um, yeah. yeah but that, and, it, and I think that that gets at the heart of, of you know, this work and representation, who, who gets to be the voice uh, dictating and, the, and making demands about what change needs to be. And, and it goes back to, for me, thinking about this community-based work, this, this work that is, in, that is about um, as I was talking to Melanie about this, you know, when she was inviting me to be a part of this panel, I was like, you know, you know, I'm not so much in, interested in, in performance anymore. Like, I'm interested in embodiment. How do we, how do we live the values that we're, that we're trying to uplift, the, the things that we talk about that are important to us, the, the things that we want to see in the world, how do we live that versus just performing it and just creating it as a spectacle or creating it as a, as a moment, how do we embody that and take that with us into every aspect of our lives? And I've, I've kind of gotten put off with performing uh, because performing doesn't give space for that to live. It creates a moment that's uh, ethereal and it just kind of evaporates, but the embodiment is what we need to actually bring about the type of transformation that we're seeking in our words. Um, and so the words are aspirational but the performance always falls short of bringing about the type of the, the transformation that that I feel like you know I'm 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 interested in seeing in this point in my life and my career, and um, I, I say that, and then I want to uh, kind of pivot a little bit because I feel like one part of the movie uh, that really that I was challenged with was this this moment um, in which uh, this this white guy who was um, um, who was um, auditioning for the role of one of the, the, the people who would beat Jesus, um, like was given the space to really get into the role. And he was so into that role. It was, was so into it. And it was, it was too so much. Disturbing. It was like, where yeah. did this come from? Where yeah. Did this, yeah. What Meisner and, and, exercise is this? Where did this? Yeah, that was, and was also, really upsetting. Go ahead, sorry. No, 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 no. Yeah, and, I, and I, was, I was also challenged in how much space that was given within the moment of, of kind of like the, as the kind of tension was rising with, with the movie, um, how much space that was given um, to this white man to vent um, in, this, in this role. So I'd love to hear more about that moment because it, it didn't trigger me, but it, act, it made me ask a lot of questions about why, why was that space given um, so much? Um, th thanks for the question. I, I just hear from, I, I will answer to it. I, I just hear from Hervé that he has to leave. So perhaps uh, Hervé, you want to say a last, uh, a last goodbye and statement before you have to leave. Uh, Hervé, la parole est à toi. Uh, J'ai juste annoncé que tu dois, que tu dois partir. Milo, je suis, je, je, suis, je suis désolé que je dois laisser la réunion, mais c'est vraiment avec un... un je, je voulais être jusqu'au bout, jusqu'à la fin. Mais, mais malheureusement, je... vous m'entendez? Oui, oui, je t'entends. Très bien, très bien. OK. Mais malheureusement, je dois, je, je dois laisser la réunion. Pour, euh, je dois aller prendre ma femme. <rire> So, uh, Hello. Hervé would really have, uh, have loved to, to stay until the end, but he has to leave. I didn't really understand the reason. You have to, to take your, your child, or what was it? Tu dois prendre ton enfant, ou qu'est-ce qu'il y a? And uh, yeah, I guess he says goodbye. Au revoir, Hervé, à très bientôt. Hein? Thank you, Edvi, for your participation in the panel. And um, I, I really want to leave space to answer that question because it is such a pivotal moment in the, in the film. Um, and I just want to 
let people know that we're, we're at a place of, of beginning to wrap up. And so Milo, um, I, I don't wanna cut you short, but if you could answer that um, question, I think would be really great. Yeah, I will, I will try to be short. Uh, uh, it's, it's interesting, we, we discussed the same question yesterday in the discussion too. And um, yeah, so for me, the interesting thing is uh, in this in this uh, uh, question about this this young guy uh, performing this torture. Um, when you give the space of improvisation to somebody in South Italy, he's by by the way a leftist. I, I know him a bit, uh, or I knew him a bit through the through the project. Why does he have access to all this, to all these rhetorics? Why is this there? Why is, uh, as, as we were formulating it yesterday, is the system talking through us? Why are we so, uh, so, so able to do that? So you could, and that's why also this scene has this length to show this, this, uh, this structure of violence. It goes on and goes on and goes on. And it goes on since hundreds of years, actually. And in South Italy, it goes on every day, every day. It's the reality of the structural violence of uh, that is that is uh, uh, acted out every day against half a million of people living there as slaves without paper. So it's really it's it's the it's it's just the it's the reality this uh, this country is living in Italy and and big parts of Europe, by the way. And I think big, spa, big parts of our civilization. And that was the, the, the depiction, you could say, true uh, embodiment or true uh, improvisation or true theater or improvisation or however, of something that is there and is speaking through this young guy at this, uh, at, uh, this very moment, through the Roman soldier, so to say. I don't know if this is a, an answer, but that's... Uh, uh, is, is what I think happens in that moment. I'm interested, um, Milo, like uh, how, uh, how much like Ivan and the, uh, the community had, imp I'm sure you had like so much more footage than we saw and how much do they have, this goes with Carlton's question, like so much of that clip is in the movie and how much other, besides being performing in this and being documented, are they in the editing process? Or looking at like sort of what the, the final presentation, or and, and there is no final, right? Is what you describe in your missions, but at least in this thing we've experienced. How do you work with community in that way? You know, I think this film is, uh, is, is uh, it premiered in, in September at the Venice Film Festival um, because it was the first festival in Europe that that happened again. And uh, it was also the first time um, we presented that film and uh, uh, in the public. But of course, we presented it uh, several times uh, before. Um, um, but I, I remember that uh, Ivan Sanier, when, when, we, when we had this premiere last September on the, on the festival, he said, OK, this is one evening. We are fighting since 20 years, and we will fight for 20 years. And uh, every day uh, we are in, in, in connection because we are, I mean, this film became a tool for the distribution of tomatoes and a film is a film and uh, it's an important tool, but it's only uh, one step in a, in a much bigger process that it's going on since many years. And it helps, of course, a lot. It helps a lot to, to raise money, to distribute tomatoes, to kind of bring these people out of, of slavery into a kind of a, a state of citizenship. And that's what the, this film is used for. And that's why this film is made for, besides the fact that it is, a, is an art piece. But uh, yeah, for me, that's only in, I mean, in the, in the case of that film, of course, I'm a filmmaker too, but it's, it's, that's not the most important uh, part for me. In, in, in that in, 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 in that example. Mila, can you say what the most important part is for you? No, for me, the most important part is again, uh, we have in, in South Italy, we have half a million of people that is true European law without any regularization, without name. If these people die, you will even not 
you'd see it because they are completely uh, put into illegality, into criminality, and they are then exploited by the mafia to produce all these uh, all these products. And the important thing is to use film to change the system, to hack the economic. That's exactly what Hervé said in the beginning. Through this film, they had a, a access to fundings and to networks of distribution to tomatoes to use exactly the tool of slavery, the tomato, to liberate themselves by producing tomatoes themselves through the networks created by the revolt of dignity through the film. So it's kind of like using film money, film funding, to change whole distribution systems, hack the economy. And I think that's what we have to do in this very moment. We have not, we have to, I think it was said in the beginning of this discussion, to really create new institutions, new ways of producing, new ways of distributing, new ways um, and, and yeah, ways of dignity uh, uh, to produce films and to produce uh, just products like tom tomatoes and to to link these 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 ways of distribution of art and of classical economics and that's what we try to do in this film since many years and that's a product a project that is ongoing we are in 150 uh, as we discussed yesterday enterprises today in 150 places we sell these tomatoes now perhaps uh, in a year it's 200 places 300 places we have now several hundred of people brought out of slavery through the production of these tomatoes, through the film distribution, and perhaps it will be more and more. So it's it's one step after the other. Thank you so much, Milo. And, you know, in closing, one of the things that I wanted to say is as I watched this film, I couldn't help but think of farm workers in the United States and uh, couldn't help but think of the recent Supreme Court ruling that happened last month in the US that limits um, unions abilities to organize in the fields, um, basically saying that if they step onto if they step onto the land that that's a taking of the land. And so it used to be that people could go and, and do union organizing in the fields and that's no longer true because private property has deemed more important than the people that are providing us our nourishment in this moment. And so one of the things that's been so inspiring about this conversation and the call that Melanie has given us um, is how do we um, see and understand solidarity uh, so that we do have the Indians and the Africans in the slave revolt so that we do have the, the taking of our own land so that our communities um, that were have a That, um, that we learn from the, the activism to, to um, inform the art, that the art informs the activism. Um, and how do we, as we continue to move the, the work in different places, build communities in all of the examples that everyone has shown today and the work that they do. And I think that this, um, a whole nother panel in this conversation that um, Carlton has brought up in terms of embodiment uh, what does it mean to embody the work of justice? What does it mean to embody the work of change? What does it mean to embody solidarity? And what does it mean for us to go beyond solidarity to imagine, not only just imagine a new world, but to overthrow the systems in order to create it? And so um, I thank you everybody for being here today and sharing with us. And a special thank you to HowlAround and the Siegel Center and our national team of co-hosts, Milo and all of our brilliant panelists. Um, but also I wanna give thanks and gratitude to Melanie Joseph and David Bruin for organizing um, and producing this whole series of events, which um, I hope is the continuation of a conversation that we've been having a very long time, a conversation that we will continue to have and that we have the opportunity, uh, Melanie, in your lifetime to see changes that you never thought possible. And so thank you everybody for your work. And if you have not seen the motherfucking film, you need to see it. It's beautiful. It's, it's, um, it's, um, it's arresting. The acting is incredible. And um, 
you know, I really encourage everybody to, to see it before midnight tonight. So gracias, everybody. Thank you very much for your work and for being here today. And thank you, everybody, for listening with such um, care as we work through different languages and translations and, and yeah. cultures and all of those things. And I, I really cannot wait to be in the room with all of y'all one day. I hope that that can happen. So gracias, thank you. Thanks so much everyone, we're off live. Ooh. Thanks everybody.